Uh, I don't. Uh, I, I'm, I'm basically a, a hopeful and optimistic uh, uh, person, and uh, I think there's, uh, in many respects, as long as uh, Americans are going to be involved and engaged, uh, I don't think it is ever. Uh, it, it, it will be broken. I think uh, what uh, when it is really kind of threatened is when Americans lose interest, lose involvement, lose engagement, and it does seem to me uh, this uh, particular year. As we're coming into the presidential year, the the uh, energy and the liveliness and the enthusiasm, in, on the, particularly on our side, the Democratic side with the Democratic candidates, uh, is very alive and very well and very involved. And I mean, the, the polls reflect it. But all you have to do is see the turnouts of people that are are turning out and involved and engaged. And I think that's the most positive indicator in terms of the strength of the uh, uh, of our uh, uh, our democracy. I think that that's. As something that we, we have to gauge. I mean, uh, I don't want to extend this answer too long, but I remember very well uh, when finally democracy came to South Africa and there was a person that had been waiting in line and, and, uh, and uh, a journalist inquired, said, how long have you been waiting in line and now you're going to vote? And he said, well, I've been waiting in line uh, for 78 hours, 78 hours, standing and waiting in line. And then the question, the journalist says, well, how old are you? And he said, I'm 78 years old, and I'm going to stay in line till I can vote. We uh, too frequently take the uh, right to vote and take uh, our uh, responsibilities, and I think it's the responsibilities of leadership, uh, of citizenship. We, we take them uh, too much for granted. We're in for sort of the ride and not for the work, and that, I think, is something that we have to be reminded of. Well, the, 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 the large issues, I think, are how are we as a, as a people, as individuals, states, country, going to deal with the challenges of globalization uh, over the period of the future? Are we going to be driven out by these forces, or are we going to be willing to grasp them and to shape them and to turn them into our advantage? I think that's a central challenge. And that means investing in people, investing in education skills, other kinds of issues or questions. And I think a follow-up um, answer to that is to understand the strength of the nation, which is our values. That's what we are, when we are respected as a country, that's what we're respected for. Those are the uh, values which are uh, inscribed both in the Declaration of Independence and also in, in, the, uh, in the Constitution. Those are the values that were expressed um, in, the, uh, in, the, in the ship May, the Mayflower, with the Mayflower Compact, about our sense of community and, and the value of, of being together. It's described in the Constitution, the general welfare uh, of our nation. That's when we have been at, at our best. And I think those are, that's our greatest uh, strength, the greatest challenge, I think, is whether we're going to be, how we're going to cope with the central challenges of a rapidly changing world, and I think the other great challenge is how we're going to maintain this strength of sense of, of community and value, uh, which has uh, been such a, a, a compelling force in the shaping uh, our own lives and also in shaping the lives of the nation. The, the great uh, dilemma, lo looking at this at, at, at glo sort of globally for a moment, is that uh, on the one side, you had people that, uh, what, what are the values that Americans care very much about? They care about people that work very hard. They care about people that care about their families. They care about people that have a, 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 a faith uh, and an understanding of, of their uh, faith. And they care very much about people that, that want to contribute and make uh, America great uh, in, in terms of the future. It so happens that those values are so often the values of the immigrants that were coming here. What they did, what you had on the other side of the coin, is this enormous magnet of the American economy drawing those individuals here, drawing those individuals here. And those people came because they were prepared to sacrifice for their families, prepared to sacrifice. But when I recognize we have 70,000 um, of the basically uh, immigrants that are serving in Iraq and serving in Afghanistan. Hundreds have died in the, this uh, war. Um, uh, and our history and our tradition is filled with millions who
who have made this country the great country as it is. All eight of my great grandparents arrived in East Boston at the dock. I can look out my window uh, in the uh, JFK building in, in Boston. I can see the dock that they arrived at. I can see the stairs, which are called uh, the golden stairs that lead on up into East Boston. Every one of them went up to that, uh, not knowing what was going to happen. And uh, they were f fortunate, some were fortunate, and we were able to participate in the uh, democracy. It's a great gift. I think that is a compelling factor about how we ought to try and deal with this. We can, we have to deal, we haven't got unlimited opportunities and open-endedness in terms of, of, uh, uh, of immigration coming to this uh, country, but we ought to be able to understand uh, what the, the, the central challenge is and be able in a humane and decent uh, way uh, respect uh, the values of, uh, that so many bring and shape and develop a, a policy that's going to also uh, secure our borders and, and preserve our national security. Well, the, the overarching uh, uh, lesson was uh, don't go to war unless you're imminently threatened. That's, don't commit American troops to battle unless you have also a plan about how you're going to bring the American troops uh, back and bring them back uh, victoriously. We, 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 and also uh, the lesson is uh, from uh, the 9-11 is who attacked us at 9-11 and shouldn't we give focus and attention on who attacked us, which was Osama bin Laden and the Taliban, rather than diverting our focus and attention uh, off uh, into a, uh, you know, a different direction. This is the greatest foreign policy disaster of our time. And the final point I would make is that we are effectively outsourcing our national security and our foreign policy to Iraqi politicians. We are making an open-ended commitment that Americans are going to stay there until they get their act together. I do not believe that we ought to commit American servicemen to have them lose their lives, shed their blood in the streets of Baghdad. I don't think we have an open-endedness in terms of the American taxpayer till the Iraqi politicians decide that they want to have reconciliation. Every military leader that has appeared before our committee, I'm in the Armed Services Committee, and I've listened carefully to all of them, uh, General Petraeus, General Casey, I've listened to all of uh, the uh, uh, General Nash, um, I've listened to General Hoare uh, from uh, Massachusetts, highly decorated Marine. And um, every one of them say that there's not the military solution. You have to have military and reconciliation. We have not, we, the military has done everything it's been asked to do for the last four and a half years. They've done it bravely. They've done it with courage. They've done it with valor. They deserve a policy that recognizes their courage and valor. And this administration does not have that.